Hello, everyone, and welcome to Science Pub. I am Stephanie Coleman, Community Education Manager at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Um, we are looking uh, into different ways to bring back our raffle so that way we can help support this free public program. But until then, we are urging you to go to our Donate Now page at sbnature.org and help support this free public program. Um, and our other education programs. We also need to remember to keep supporting and local um, supporting our local restaurants like Dargan's. So we really hope that you have ordered your fish and chips. Um, and until we can be back there in person and supporting them with our business that way. So um, they've hosted us for over 12 years. Uh, and so we really want to continue to make sure that they are doing well, like all the other businesses too during COVID. Um, so for those of you that don't know, this last weekend was Fiesta Weekend in Santa Barbara. And I know it doesn't feel like Fiesta because uh, a lot of it was virtual. Um, for those of you that aren't in the Santa Barbara area, Fiesta Weekend, this is the 96th uh, Old Spanish Days Santa Barbara Fiesta Weekend, and it celebrates our heritage and culture. And normally all around town, there's little kids slamming cascarones, which are um, confetti filled eggs on each other's heads and parades and dances and tamales. And um, it's just a really great celebration. So for those of you locals, um, viva la fiesta. Um, so in the spirit of that, um, Chris Coulter, who is our longtime AV expert and a staple of our Science Pub program, um, Chris, do you have any amazing Viva La Fiesta mm -hmm. stories? Well, uh, the story I, that I recall is one that happened when I was, I was, I think I was in grade school and it was my first experience with a cascarone and I really didn't understand. I thought, I thought these eggs were like the Easter bunny eggs or something and they were, they had actually egg in them, but um, a, a friend of mine who thought it would be, be terribly funny to hit me with one of these things came up behind me and smashed it on my head. <clears throat> and I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, viva la fiesta. And I went, oh, now I got an egg in my hair. And then I realized that my hair was full of these little bits. And, and then I realized that I was starting to get itchy down my back. And before I knew it, I had glitter and, and little confetti pieces in my underwear. And it was... <laughs> It was an awful experience. So consequently, I, I don't actually do cascarones anymore, except the ones that have the really big paper in them. Uh, and it's been a few years since I, since I did that. I, I have to confess, I haven't been to a parade probably in 20 years. But um, it is a wonderful tradition uh, to, to bring out the, um, the, the contributing um, Spanish and, and Mexican influence that we have in this town. Uh, it's a beautiful time. Uh, we mustn't forget the Chumash, however, who, who uh, did a lot to make Proceeded. everything happen. The, yep. <laughs> but um, today I have a friend here on my shoulder, uh, and this is a, um, uh, a fellow who kind of reminds me a little bit of a dinosaur. When I, when I look at his picture, I always think of a dinosaur. And it's a ground hornbill. And it was one of the birds we, we saw in Africa when we were there back in 2016. Um, and uh, I'm really kind of excited to hear this talk because, gosh, dinosaurs, they play a big, a big part in a kid's life, especially boys' lives these days. It seems like, uh, you know, uh, the seven to, or maybe six to 12-year-old kids are all just crazy about it. But I have a couple of jokes. So one was, uh, uh, why can't you hear a pterosaur using the bathroom? Because uh -oh. the, the P is silent. <laughs> Classic. Uh, okay, yeah, I didn't hear any. I, it's the sound of one hand clapping. What, what do you call a dinosaur with an extensive vocabulary? A thesaurus. <laughs> Those are pretty solid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's my contribution for tonight. I, I'm, I'm glad everybody's here. I don't want people to forget to go to the museum website and punch that donate button and give what you can, when you can. Definitely. That's it. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. So Jenna, do you happen to have a, a quick Viva La Fiesta story? Sure. Um, well, I haven't been in Santa Barbara that long and my story isn't uh, particularly associated with Fiesta, but there's something that um, 
the teens in my program and I do every year around this time or during fiesta time. And that's that we go on a little field trip with the museum's visitor services and butterfly pavilion manager, Kim Zimbeck. She takes me and some of the new quasars downtown and they learn all about guest experiences at other businesses so they can apply that back at the museum. And it's almost always around one fiesta time and Kim's birthday and we get ice cream and it's so fun. And so I always have like really good memories associated with Fiesta because of that. Another thing too is that uh, Santa Barbara High School always has an elote stand um, and they make the best elotes. Very nice. Well, and since it's close to Kim's birthday, happy birthday to Kim. She does so much around the museum. So Thank she you. supports the museum very much too. Um, all right. So I want to thank our speaker tonight, Jenna, who you're looking at right now. Uh, she gave this talk to the educators at the museum and we enjoyed and learned so much that they then invited her to present all to you. Um, paleobiologist Jenna Roll works at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History where she engages youth in year-round science and nature programs as teen programs manager. Jenna holds a Bachelor's of Science in Molecular Biology and a Master's of Science in Earth Sciences. In addition to her post at the museum, she teaches courses in Earth and Planetary Sciences at Santa Barbara City College. And when she's not working, she enjoys gravel biking, climbing, and generally playing in the dirt. So Jenna, let's dig into dinos. Great. Well, thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Um, we're here, we're gonna talk about dinosaurs. I know that some of you that are joining us tonight are sort of like science pub alumni, as I would say, or you're like regulars. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this platform and making it work from home. But I have to imagine that some of you also saw the word dinosaur in the title and you're like inner five year old just started going nuts because dinosaurs and I'm so glad um, All of our inner kids us as adults like Chris Coulter said there's just something about dinosaurs that really just like excites the imagination right they're not really around anymore. They were really big. They seem pretty ferocious. There's just there's so much wrapped up in a dinosaur. Um, so as we talk about what a dinosaur is, I want you to know that the history of dinosaurs and the research surrounding dinosaurs has really come a long way um, in the past you know, few decades. If you were a kid sometime, um, maybe prior to the 1970s, 1980s, you probably remember all of these sort of illustrations of dinosaurs as being sort of like dumb and slow and like lumbering. It wasn't really until the 1990s that we realized that there was a connection between dinosaurs and birds and that actually dinosaurs were probably highly intelligent and very cr capable creatures. So there's just been a lot of advancements um, in sort of the realm in, of dinosaurs. So as part of our journey tonight, and I'm gonna call it a journey, because some of the notions you have of what a dinosaur is are gonna be shattered and it's okay. We're gonna get through it together. We're gonna to do a little bit of unlearning, but we're gonna come out of it with a greater appreciation for dinosaurs, a better understanding, and you're gonna be so knowledgeable, right? So if you ever have like a coworker of mine, a five-year-old who approaches you and starts spouting off about what they think a dinosaur is, you can, you just shut that little five-year-old down because you're going to know after this. <laughs> I don't recommend picking fights with children, but if you have to. Um, so we're going to start off with something that often sends my students at City College into somewhat of a cold sweat. And what we're looking at here is called a cladogram. This is what we use in the study of cladistics. This is also called an evolutionary tree, sort of the more common colloquial name. And us as evolutionary biologists, as paleontologists, we make these cladograms or these evolutionary trees to show the relationships between different types of organisms. So there's a lot of information here and that's why it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so let me just unpack it a little bit. You've probably seen one of these before in some sort of fashion. Um, different people have different styles of drawing them. Um, sometimes they're on their side, sometimes they're V's instead of squares and boxes. Sometimes they are upside down, so they kind of look like a child's mobile. Um, 
This isn't my preferred structure because this sort of infers some sort of hierarchy that, I, that isn't quite real, but really what we're showing here is relationships. So what we're looking at in the entirety is a cladogram of organisms called amniotes. You and I are amniotes, dinosaurs are amniotes, reptiles are amniotes. This just means that we are all capable of internal fertilization. So some of us carry our you know, young embryos in our bodies and others of them put them in eggs. Doesn't matter how you do it. It just means that you don't have to use water to reproduce. So you're an amniote, you don't have to spawn. The thing that puts all of these organisms into different categories are things called evolutionary novelties. Or if you wanna be fancy, you can call them shared derived traits. But we're not gonna be fancy here tonight because this is a pub talk. And so we're gonna call them evolutionary novelties. Basically the way these cladograms work is that the sort of circles towards the top fit into the, all of the circle groups below them. So in this instance, reptiles are amniotes, right? Diapsids are reptiles and amniotes. Archosaurs are diapsids, reptiles, and amniotes. You get the idea. Um, it's kind of like Russian nesting dolls. There's like one big one and then smaller ones that go inside of it. So if you're a dinosaur, which you see up at the upper right-hand corner, you're all of the things that come before. So something that cladograms do is tell us about evolutionary history. So we can infer that time is moving as we go further up the chain. But something we wanna make sure that we don't get confused here is that there's some sort of hierarchy of, um, of more evolved, right? It would, we would be remiss to think that dinosaurs are somewhat are more evolved than crocodiles or that pterosaurs are more evolved than turtles. They're not, they're just different branches on a tree. We're just showing the relationships to one another. Something you've probably noticed already um, that might be one of these things that's shattering your preconceived notions of a dinosaur is that pterosaurs, which are pterodactyls, pterodons, are not in the same box as dinosaurs. So that is to say, pterodactyls, pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. It's okay though, because they're like the closest relative to dinosaurs. They're what we call sister groups. They're very closely related. They're just not the same, right? They're related in some way, but not the same. You might also notice that um, you don't see yourself on this cladogram. Like, where are you? And that's because we belong in this group over here called synapsids. So here comes one of the interactive parts of this talk. I need everyone to put their fingers on their temples, right? You can open your jaw and close it. It will kind of stimulate the temporal mandibular uh, muscles that open your jaw. Those temples are what make us synapsids. It means that we have a set of holes on each side of our head that our muscles attach through from our jaw up to our skull and allows us to talk and smile and eat food, which is the best part. Um, so we are synapsids, which means that we are not part of these other groups. Synapsids include the mammals. Mammals, as you know, come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, all sorts of personalities, types, and opinions. Um, but we're not alone um, in being synapsids. Nay, nay. We are also joined in our little box by another um, more reptilian looking synapsid, um, one of which is this picture, Dimetrodon. Again, this might be shattering some of your ideas of what a dinosaur is. Dimetrodon, not a dinosaur. Looks like a reptile, looks like a lizard, looks like it could be a dinosaur, but actually much more closely related to us than it is to those others. Sadly, the non-mammalian synapsids um, are all extinct, um, and so we are the only living um, representative of the synapsid group. So as I mentioned previously, the way we make these different categories is something called evolutionary novelties. So what exactly is an evolutionary novelty? Well, these are shared characters, like I said. And so these can be things like physical features. So having four legs, right? Um, that's the evolutionary novelty that defines the group um, tetrapod, tetra, four, or it can be backbones, right? That is the evolutionary novelty that defines the group vertebrae. It means as an evolutionary novelty that everybody in that group has that trait. And that's what 
keeps you together as a family, right? So it could be feathers, etc. physical features. It could also be biochemical features. So we know that DNA, RNA, and protein sequences are shared among different um, evolutionary groups, different, different clades, if you will, um, groups of organisms like humans, right? We all share the same DNA, RNA, and protein sequences. Those are our biochemical features. Behavioral features can be an evolutionary novelty. So some groups could be defined by maternal care, whether they you know, sit on their eggs in a nest or whether they just sort of leave them and wait for them to hatch on their own. Um, you know, these sort of rearing behaviors. And then absence of features, though we try to use the absence of features really sparingly um, because these are oftentimes things that are what we call secondarily lost, which means that other organisms that are closely related to them in a group probably still have those characteristics and are probably all still closely related. This is sort of the case with no legs and snakes. Snakes are reptiles that are closely related to other reptiles. They just don't have legs anymore. They don't need them. Um, or the loss of tails in apes. So the evolutionary novelties that unite all dinosaurs are actually quite simple. Um, they're not as complicated as you might think. Um, one of those novelties is having an erect posture and a narrow track gait. What that simply means is they stand up straight and their legs are positioned below them, as you can sort of see in this little biomechanical drawing over here. Right, so we see it in this Verasaurus, right? We see that its legs are underneath it. It's got a narrow, narrow gait. It walks with its legs narrowly. Same thing here in this Coelophysis, which is also a dinosaur, and here in this chicken, also a dinosaur. Their legs are underneath them and they walk close together. I should note that the dinosaurs in this photo are, are in the slide are not to scale. <laughs> a Verasaurus would probably be about as tall as maybe a three-story building, um, while a Coelophysis probably isn't that much bigger than a chicken. Um, so make note of that. So just to kind of describe that a little bit more, here we have some sort of lizard-like reptile, and it has this sprawling posture. If you look at it from the top down, you see that its legs are sort of positioned outside of itself, right? This is what we call a wide gait. This is what alligators, crocodiles have, right? You can imagine, probably imagine, um, like a gecko or a lizard, like, you know, when they walk, they do this sort of thing, right? Um, it's actually really energetically costly. Think about trying to walk on four legs while you are sort of like mid push-up, right? Like I can barely do push-ups and the idea of like walking while doing that seems like a no-go. So that's a, that's a sprawling posture. Versus um, this upright posture that dinosaurs have by putting their legs underneath them, as you can see in sort of the top down view here, they have an, what we call a narrow gait, right? Much narrower. And that's just much more efficient. It gets the body up off the ground. You're not compressing your lungs every time you take a step. There's just more room for movement. Now comes another interactive portion of the talk. So along with having a narrow um, track gait and an erect posture, you have to have some morphological changes, some changes in the way your body is put together. Um, one of those is having an opening in your hip socket that's bordered by a bony ridge, right? So you have this in your body, right? If you, you probably can't see this, but if you feel your hip, right, um, you know where the top of your, your femur goes into place, you have that bony hip ridge as well. It helps keep your legs underneath you. And you have this bone here, a femur um, with an interned head, right? Here's the head of that femur, it's turned inward. It's what keeps that hip bone, your femur head in the hip socket. A beautiful design, a wonderful design, has been seen time and time again in different types of animals. It's the strongest joint in your body. There's a reason why people don't dislocate their, uh, their hips very often. Um, it's very, very strong, excellent for keeping um, your body up and your legs positioned beneath you, right? So all of this is to say, these are the evolutionary novelties of dinosaurs. All of them are associated with efficient locomotion, right? So prior to them, their ancestors didn't quite have these novelties and it's these novelties that probably gave them a pretty good advantage um, going forward and led into the appearance of some of our first dinosaurs. So all of our first dinosaurs are, were small, 
bipedal, meaning that they walked on two legs, and we think they were really fast, right? So um, here we have Eoraptor, um, which is probably only about a meter in height, would come up to a six foot tall man's knee about. And another good representative of an early dinosaur. So when I say early dinosaur, I mean the first dinosaurs to appear, which appeared sometime, we think in um, sort of the mid Triassic. Um, here we have Pererosaurus, was probably somewhere between two to three meters in height, would maybe come up to um, my waist, um, small, bipedal and fast. It wasn't until later that dinosaurs evolved their quadrupedal stance, so four legs, um, and much larger sizes. It's kind of like starting a business, right? Um, it's kind of like, it's like Apple. It's like Steve Jobs when he was like in a garage. That's first dinosaurs. It's not until later the dinosaurs become like Apple conglomerate Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs. So if you want to think of it that way. Um, I do this all the time in my class at City College, I make analogies that I get caught up in and like I can't get out of them. So I hope that made sense. <laughs> um, but there should be some alarms going off for you. If, if they're not, um, let's, we should talk about it, right? Um, we have an erect posture, right? Well, most of us, if you, you know, trying to work on it, not slouch so much. Um, but we have an erect posture, right? We have a narrow track gait. Our legs are positioned beneath us. Uh, we are fast. We started out small. So are we dinosaurs? Question marks? Well, no. <laughs> um, remember, let's think back to this cladogram um, that we were looking at. Um, here we have dinosaurs again in the upper right hand corner. And if you remember uh, really well, if you remember correctly, um, we're here in the synapsid group, right? With our um, long, lost, long lost extinct um, sort of reptilian like ancestors. So we're not dinosaurs. So how can it be that dinosaurs and mammals have very, very similar traits that have led to our success, um, let's say, as a, as a species, as a group, as a clade. Well, this is where this idea of homologous versus convergent characteristics comes into play. Homologous traits are traits that are similar due to inheritance from a common ancestor. Okay, so this can, in mammals, um, be the arm structure or the bone structure of our arms and hands. We all have a humerus, radius, and ulna, and uh, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges um, that are all the same bones, right? And we inherited those from a, a common ancestor. Let's say our great, great grandparent. We got that from. They may look a little bit different in different areas of our families, but we have that same sort of thing in, um, you can think about it in your familiar family, right? Um, you're related to your siblings, you're related to your parents, you're related to your cousins. You don't all look like clone versions of yourself, right? They're all a little bit different. There's variation within species, there's variation within clades, right? This is how we get um, biodiversity. So, but the important point to take away here is that homolog homologous characters are inherited from a common ancestor. We did not get our upright erect posture. Um, from a common ancestor with dinosaurs. Instead, we have these features through convergent evolution, um, which means that the characteristics we have are similar, but not inherited from a common ancestor, right? So a really good example of this are wings in flight, right? So here we have a condor and a butterfly. They both have wings, they both fly, but I think all of you are uh, educated, woke enough to know that these two things are not closely related to one another, right? Birds are vertebrates for one, they have a backbone, while butterflies are invertebrates and have an exoskeleton but don't have any internal bones. Very different parts of the evolutionary animal tree, right? 
but they both still have wings and they both fly. It's because there are certain things, there are certain traits, certain ways of being um, in animals that are just super successful. Flight is one of those things. Bats could fall into this category as well, right? The only flying mammal. If you are trying to evade predators, flight is a really good way to do that. And so it makes sense that flight would evolve again and again and again throughout animal history, throughout the 540 million years that animals have been um, you know, visible within the rock record. It makes sense that a good design would um, repeat itself. So flight is a really good one of these. And our erect posture and the traits that we share with dinosaurs in terms of our efficient locomotion are convergent um, characteristics, not independently acquired, if you will. But let's get back to dinosaurs. Um, so there are two main groups of dinosaurs. So here we're looking at sort of a um, truncated or um, condensed cladogram. Here we have dinosaurs again, right? And I've broken them into the two main um, groups, Saurischia and Ornithischia. Now we should pause here um, because this cladogram, this interpretation is not set in stone. Um, I've already probably given you some information that um, was not maybe well known um, prior to the 1990s. And that's the really wonderful thing is that science is fueled by new discoveries and reinterpreting ideas with new evidence. And so the evidence surrounding dinosaur relate, relatedness to each other is constantly changing, right? It's all based off of the fossil record and bones and morphology and anatomy, right? Because we can't get DNA out of, out of dinosaur fossils, unfortunately. Um, so our interpretations have to change in light of new evidence. This is sort of the classic, um, maybe most agreed upon um, sort of arrangement of dinosaurs. But know that you could um, do a little Google search yourself and see that that information is, is changing. So how is this interpretation made? Well, the division here is based on something called a pubic bone. So what we're looking at here um, is a pelvis. We're looking at it from the side view. So if I was to stand sideways, we're looking at it from the side. This pubic bone um, in serrations points forward. Um, we call this lizard hips. And in ornithicians, um, this pubic bone points backwards. So it points towards the back um, along with the other bones in the pelvis as well. And we call this bird hips. So within the sauritians, those that had forward-facing pubises, as we say, we have the sauropodomorphs, which are our long neck dinosaurs. We have our theropods, which are our sort of classic um, Allosaurians and Ceratosaurians and Megalosaurians and T-Rex, right? Um, and also our birds, um, our aves fall into the Sauritian category as well. So these types of dinosaurs are more closely related to one another than to the Ornithicians. So some of these members of the Sauritian group are extant, which means some of them are still alive and those are the aves. They exist today. Then we have our ornithicians, which include things like the ceratopsians. We'll go into more of these um, types of groups um, in just a second in a little bit more detail. But the ornithicians include things like the ceratopsians and the stegosaurians, right? These really iconic, um, large, four-legged um, dinosaurs. All of the ornithician members are extinct, gone. So sad, we miss them. Um, but you might have noticed something here that again should be setting off some alarm bells in your brains, right? So ornithicians are called bird hit, but our birds are part of the, the Sauritian group, the lizard hip group. So this is one of the biggest misnomers in American or in paleontology in general. It causes me a lot of strife and headache in my dinosaurs course every semester. So when we first started finding fossils of ornithicians, we realized, oh, hey, their hips look just like the hips in birds, because birds also have backward facing pubic pubis bones. So unlike the rest of their serrician relatives, 
they independently or convergently evolved a backwards facing pubis. The understanding surrounding this isn't very well known. Um, there are some hypotheses, but it's kind of one of those question marks in paleontology. So if you're a young viewer watching and you're looking to answer some dinosaur related questions as a future paleontologist, this would be a really good area for you to um, do some, some exploring, try to figure out this mystery. But the confusion here always is that the group with the bird hips does not actually contain the birds. It was just misnamed um, because of this convergent trait that they, that they share together. So these groups, let's just deep dive just a little bit more. So the ornithicians, um, this is what I call like, just like dinos quick dinosaur show and tell. Like we're just gonna get some greatest hits in here. Um, the ornithicians include the ankylosaurians. Um, so these are the very heavily armored dinosaurs. Right? They are known for having these big dermal plates on their body. They're like the tanks of dinosaurs. They're just heavily armored, um, these big club tails, sometimes horns on their head, some of these like big periscapular spines. They're cool. I like them, <laughs> if you couldn't gather that. Um, and then our stegosaurians, or our, our roofed lizards, so named because they have these big plates on their back, very iconic, right, have been debated what their purpose is throughout, um, throughout time as well. And then these large tail spikes, which are called thagomizers. You can write that down. Thagomizer is the name of the spiked tail. I'll let you do a little bit of research to learn where that name came from. Also within our ornithicians are our ceratopsians. So that includes our like iconic uh, triceratops, right? Three horns. Uh, it should be noted that the ceratopsians are very diverse. There's all sorts of ceratopsians that have like 10 horns, centrosaurian, there's cosmosaurians. Um, they have all sorts of really cool um, horn configurations. It's sort of a bummer that triceratops gets such all the limelight because they're like some way cooler ones, like no offense. Um, but also within our ceratopsians, we have our protoceratopsids. These are like our ceratopsians, except they don't have horns. And then oh, my favorite member of the ceratopsian group, the uh, cetacosaurids. They're just little guys. Um, they get overlooked because they're in this group with all these much bigger guys, but they're adorable. Fantastic fossil record of cetacosaurians. And then our pachycephalosaurids. So pachy stands for thick or, or dense. Cephla means head. Um, so they are thick headed dinosaurs. Um, I always jokingly in my class, I kind of give them sort of a bro -y, like meathead persona, um, but there's, the fossil record does not necessarily reflect that sort of um, behavior um, that's just imposed by me. But um, our pachycephalosaurids um, have these really thick dermal skulls. I like to think of them as like the rams um, of the dinosaur world. There is some evidence that they were using that really thick skull to um, either bat into one another um, or, or fend off other predators. And last but not least within our ornithicians group are our hadrosaurids and our iguanodontids. So these are our hadrosaurids. Um, they include what we would sort of call the duck-billed dinosaurs, right? They got these big snouts. Um, our California state dinosaur is within the hadrosaurid group, the, uh, what is it? The Augustinosaurid, Augustinosaurus. It's named after some, some family where it was found. Um, Augustinosaurus. Um, so the hadrosaurids as well as the iguanodontids um, that look very similar to the hadrosaurids, except they have this like really cool gnarly thumb spike, um, which originally when this dinosaur was first described and illustrated, they put the thumb spike on its nose because they thought it was a nose horn, but boy did they find out it wasn't. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are our ornithicians. Moving into our sauritians. Um, one of the major groups are our sauropodomorphs. These are the long neck dinosaurs. These are our uh, apatosauruses. These are our brontosauruses, our diplodocids, um, chimerosaurus, titanosaurians, or, you know, the long neck guys, brach brachiosaurus. So um, those are the sauropodomorphs. And then the theropods. So the theropods are an extremely diverse group. Um, of sauritians, um, which include things like, like I said before, 
the Tyrannosaurids, the Spinosauruses, the Megalosauruses, the Ceratosaurians, all of the raptors. So whether that be Velociraptor, Utah Raptor, um, Micro Raptor, it also includes Archaeopteryx, which is the first sort of agreed upon um, bird ancestor. It has some characteristics of its dinosaur ancestors before and some characteristics of birds. Very cool. Um, the Rhizinosaurians, which I like to think of um, as the giant ground sloth equivalent of the Cretaceous. They are thought to be one of the only um, herbivorous Ceritians. Most of the others um, were largely carnivores. And then, of course, the birds. The birds are within the theropod group. They evolved from a theropod ancestor. They are theropods themselves. And something that people may not be aware of or aren't given credit to is that birds started evolving in the Jurassic and were within ecosystems by the Cretaceous. So there were birds living alongside non-avian dinosaurs. So when people start really like lamenting the loss of, of dinosaurs and they're like, dang, wouldn't it be just so cool if we could own a dinosaur? Or wouldn't it be so, isn't it such a bummer that they're not around? Well, they are. <laughs> Some of you probably have them at your house, right? Maybe you harvest their eggs. Maybe they are very beloved house pets. Um, so they are around and they're with us. And birds have a much longer evolutionary history than they are given credit for. We kind of just associate them with the Cenozoic when they got really diverse, but they were there. They were alongside, um, say, our Titanosaurians or our Hadrosaurids. All right, great. We did it. You know what a dinosaur is now. Now we should probably talk about what's not a dinosaur, just to kind of tie it together and recap. All of these things are not dinosaurs, right? Pterosaurs, as you learned in the beginning, not dinosaurs, but very close. They're like siblings to dinosaurs. Dimetrodon, our cousin, much more closely related to us, right? This is us, we're in the mammal group. We have a wide diversity of different things, but again, not a dinosaur. And then these three other groups, the plesiosaurs, the ichthyosaurs, and the mosasaurs. I'm really gonna bet that you grew up thinking that these were marine dinosaurs. As one would, they look like dinosaurs. And they're oftentimes presented as dinosaurs in, in illustrations and in, in literature, but they're not. Um, I know, such a bummer, no marine dinosaurs, but not a bummer because we have marine-ish dinosaurs living around us today in the form of things like penguins, right? And sort of like grebes. <laughs> um, they're not fully aquatic, they're not fully marine, but they spend a good portion of their lives in the water. And that's the closest we get to having marine dinosaurs. So if plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and mosasaurs aren't dinosaurs, well, where do they fit into the story um, of, of amniotes, of life? Again, I sort of labeled some of these other major groups. We think that mosasaurs belong in the lizard category. I say lizards and kin here because lizards is a sort of a broad term. Um, but mosasaur is probably a type of um, lizard that evolved from something that lived terrestrially on land and then readapted um, to a life in water. We actually think that their closest living relative are monitor lizards. The plesiosaurus. We don't really know, and that's okay. Um, again, any um, young um, budding paleontologist watching, plesiosaurs would be a good place for future research. Um, we think that they're probably somewhat closely related to lizards. We know that they're in this group diapsids, which we don't need to worry about at the moment. And then we think ichthyosaurs are somewhere in here as well. Um, this is one of the really great things um, about paleontology is that you don't have, you don't just like, come into it with all the answers. There's always something to learn, always something to explore. And, you know, we call that um, career um, security, right? <laughs> There's always questions to ask, something to find. You're always going to have some way to be employed. Looking up here at the mammals, just to kind of bring it back home to us, because um, we like that, um, you see three branches stemming off of the mammal group. We're here on this one, along with things like elephants, 
dolphins, shrews, um, you know, giraffes, pretty much all the mammals you can think of, right, that come to mind. We're in that group with them here on this branch. These two other groups that are more closely related to one another, though I haven't pictured members here, are, are marsupials. So kangaroos, wombats, possums, right? And then our monotremes, which um, are our egg-laying mammals. Um, there's not many of them, the platypus and the echidna, um, but there are egg-laying mammals. Those are the, the mammal groups. That was it. I really want to say thank you to the Museum of Natural History and Sea Center for um, letting me show up every day and, you know, live my best life and my dream and surrounding me with all the resources I need to succeed. Um, and also to City College and UC Santa Barbara um, for passing along so much institutional knowledge and also giving me the tools over time to succeed and be where I am today. Um, and then thank you to all of you for joining us on this platform, for clicking that donate button on our website, um, and just being fantastic patrons of our beautiful institution. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Jenna, thank you so much. It's our pleasure to get to work with you every day, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to be opening up the question and answer portion. Um, and how we're going to be doing that is through that question and answer toggle at the very bottom of your screen. You can also use the chat. I'll try to monitor that, but the question and answer um, toggle or button is the best way to answer questions. So um, our first question is from an anonymous attendee, and I think they just want like a quick summary. So it says, how can you tell if a creature is a dinosaur, like the pterosaurs, what exactly does a dinosaur have that it does not have? That's a great question. Um, and I'm so glad you asked. Um, so the thing that unites, again, the evolutionary novelties that unite pterosaurs and dinosaurs are they have a very similar foot construction. They have this thing called a mesotarsal ankle. Um, they have that in common. And then um, they also, oh boy, it just like left my brain. Um, they just have a couple of features in common with one another that, that unite them together. Again, they're sort of features that um, are for efficient locomotion. Oh, digit-degrade stance, which isn't a tongue twister. It just means that they walk on their digits, on their toes. Um, so we're plantar, we put our feet flat on the ground. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs um, walk on their toes. So that's oh. how you would tell it. I, again, this is sort of like one of the things is like, our human brains like really like to put things into categories based on how they look, whether that be, you know, because pterosaurs kind of look like dinosaurs, understandably, because they're closely related, we just kind of lump them together. Same with Dimetrodon, it looks very prehistoric and dinosaur-like. Um, so just our human brains really like to make, you know, these types of associations. All right, and then um, another question, is is the Loch Ness monster thought to be a dinosaur? Uh, the Loch Ness monster is thought to be a hoax. <laughs> Sadly, uh, it would be cool if like plesiosaurs were um, still still bumping around somewhere. But no, I think it, um, that photo was taken in the early 1900s and sort of was revealed that it was um, a hoax. <laughs> All right, um, the next question is, uh, why did T-Rex have small arms? Why is a difficult question, or is a different, is it sort of a difficult question to, to ask. Um, what I think we like to ask instead is, okay, it had these sort of tiny arms, was it using them or was it not, or like what was it using them for? Um, when T-Rex was actually first discovered, the paleontologist who found the fossil um, did not think that the arms he found in association with it went along with that fossil because they were so small. Um, but afterwards and throughout the years, they discovered that they were actually probably quite strong, um, able to, if they could like do like bicep curls, like um, each maybe like um, curl about like 500 pounds each. So the idea is that that they probably use them to hold down struggling prey, um, whether they were killing them or, or eating them. But I think that's well, the best hypothesis. 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, how often are new fossils being discovered that make your profession scratch its head? Oh, all the time. <laughs> um, especially when it comes to bird and bird ancestor types of fossils. Um, there's this really amazing quarry in China, um, in Liaoning, um, that opened up sometime in the 1980s. People started finding fossils of bird like ancestors fossils that had feathers on them and that's really that was like the last piece of evidence that we needed as paleontologists to definitively say okay birds are dinosaurs they're related to dinosaurs so it was in like the 1980s and 1990s that um, we were able to present that to the public and say like ta-da but we're always finding like new interesting types of feathered dinosaurs we're finding fossils of dinosaurs that are in the ornithischian category, like Cetacosaurids that had some type of feathers on them as well. So this, specifically when it comes to feathers, which I could talk about, I have like a whole lecture on it. I could talk about it forever. Um, the story just becomes more and more complicated the more and more we find. That's a fantastic thing. Yeah. I feel like that's true with most science disciplines. You know, you, you find what you think is an answer. Yeah, it's like, it's always like, Great science. yeah, the more you learn, the less you know, which is right, great. For sure. Uh, so the next question is, why don't they rename things like the Basilosaurus? I'm not a paleontologist. Um, <laughs> thought to be the first marine mammal, but in its name is Saurus. So aka the lizard, an AKA dinosaur, it just confuses people. So why keep those, those old names with the source at the end? Oh, okay. So this is complicated. Nuclear drama. There's so much drama. Oh, these instances are like, we don't get a whole lot of drama in paleontology. So thank you for like letting me go off about this, but changing names for taxonomic names of things, the nomenclature rules that we use are actually really outdated and tricky. So if you wanted to change the name of something, you have to petition for it. And there's like a group of, I assume men, I don't know, that sit around in a room together and like deliberate whether they should pass this new name change or not. Um, but there's a certain amount of rules that go into one, giving something a scientific name and then renaming or eliminating a name um, if something is incorrect. I highly recommend reading Stephen Jay Gould's Bully for Brontosaurus. Um, Great read. Awesome. All right. The questions are just rolling in now. So um, Juan asks, what kind of dinosaur fossils have been found in the Tri-County area? Mm. So there aren't actually a lot of dinosaur fossils in California, period. Um, it's amazing that we have a California state dinosaur because um, as far as I've been able to figure out maybe only a handful of dinosaur fossils have been found in California um, because during the Mesozoic most of California was underwater um, and as you just learned there aren't any marine dinosaurs so um, there's not really a fossil record um, of dinosaurs in California we think that the fossils that we have found throughout California were sort of washed out to sea and then and then buried out in, in the ocean so there's none in the Tri-County area that I can think of. I think down in LA, um, there was maybe some ankylosaurian or nodosaurian fossils found. The science pub that we did last year um, highlighted all the megafauna because there were some really big animals that were found, especially around the Lompoc area. Um, and there's a lot of paleontologists working on that. So um, yeah, we did have a, a great lecture that's recorded um, somewhere highlighting all the megafauna fossils that we do have in California. Um, great, so Dennis asks, have there been any dinosaur, oh, that's that. Um, what bugs you most about the movie Jurassic Park? <laughs> <An anonymous. laughs> question. Um, this is actually an extra credit assignment that I give my students every semester is to watch one of the Jurassic Park films and then write down five things that are true based on what we learned in class and like five things that they got really wrong. Um, I don't know if there's like, I think, mm, I do know. Thank you for asking this question. I do know. Um, the theropods, the um, Cielosaurians that don't have any feathers. <laughs> That's my biggest beef. 
none of the raptors have feathers and we know that they had feathers. Um, T-Rex probably had feathers um, and so none of them have feathers. So it's just not, it's not accurate. It's a, it's a false narrative. I know every time I go to the ostrich farm and feed those emus, I'm like, this is what they should look like in Jurassic Park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so <laughs> last question. Uh, how do you know in which period each dinosaur lives in? Um, like, how do you know that the T-Rex lived in the late Cretaceous? And like late versus early and that kind of thing. Um, so part of it, ugh, it's part of these like principles of, of paleontology. You can use um, relative dating principles. So the way that rocks get laid down, the oldest ones are on the bottom and the youngest ones are on the top. Um, and so we can use that principle. Um, it's kind of like building a layer cake, right? So you can, the one you put down first is the oldest relative to the one on the top. And let's say you're gonna put some different type of um, flavoring in each of those cakes, right? And you're gonna stay consistent with it. You know that strawberry is always in the bottom layer. Mm, red velvet's always in the layer above that. Vanilla is always in the layer above that and chocolate's in the layer above that. Well, that's how fossils work as well. We figured out pretty early on back in the 1700s or so that um, there are just some fossils that show up in some time periods and fossils that don't show up in others. So we're able to use those relative dating principles. Now within more modern times and as technology has come along, we can use more absolute dating principles. So we're able to actually take rock samples and use um, chemistry to be able to figure out the numeric date in which they were created. Rocks are really cool in this way where um, certain types of them, when they solidify and become a rock, they sort of trap the, the moment in time that they became a rock. So we use those to be able to give us numeric ages um, throughout the rock record. So that's how we know that T-Rex lived during the late Cretaceous. We combine all of this sort of previous knowledge and all of these new technology techniques to come up with the most precise um, date estimates that we possibly can. Great, thank you so much. So I think we've exhausted all of the paleo questions and thank you, Jenna. Um, and thank you, Chris, for joining, um, for continuing to join us and be a staple, um, some kind of normalcy in our science pub world. Um, and for even more normalcy, we really encourage you for next month um, to go ahead and order um, some food from Dargan's Irish Pub. Uh, you can pick it up before um, and I know it's been hard for some of you to register as well. We're trying to work on all of that. We're trying to get raffles. So each month we're trying to learn the technology a little better um, in order to serve you the science that you love. Um, so yes, uh, let's see. We also know that in these difficult times, um, it it's hard on all of us and it's been especially hard on museums. Um, there was a new survey that actually stated that around 30% um, of museums may never reopen again. Um, and that's a scary that's thought true. of all of that uh, knowledge being lost. Um, so if you're able to, please go ahead and donate to the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center and any other of your favorite museums. Um, so if, if you are able to donate, please go ahead and do that. Um, so on a happier note, sorry, <laughs> that was a little, a little dark. Um, next month, please join us on September 14th. We have a truly charismatic and engaging speaker. We have author Janet Dowling Sands, and she will be speaking to why history needs science and be focusing on California history. Um, it's gonna be very, very fascinating. So we hope that you all join us on Monday, September 14th. Thank you again for supporting Science Pub, our, our free public program, and for supporting the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Jenna, 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 thank you so Yay. much. Yay! <laughs> and for the applause, built-in applause. Thanks, Chris Coulter. All right, take care, everyone. Be sure to wash your hands and stay safe. We will see you September 14th. Bye.